to uh, tell me what, how important a role in this story, in this epic story, how important is Todd Rundgren's part in, in Bad Out of Hell? Well, I think Todd Rundgren is, well, first of all, I think he's a genius, and I don't use that word a lot. I don't think I've ever used it about more than two or three people in pop music. He's certainly the only genius I've ever worked with. Um, he's awesome. He, he actually takes my breath away, Todd. He, um, I wish people knew how brilliant he really is, even though his albums are staggering. They're not even the tip of the iceberg. He, um, he was so instrumental in this being done. For one thing, he's the only producer who would do it. <laughs> so just on that basis alone, he was very valuable. Every other producer rejected it. Forgetting the record companies, we went to every producer and got comments like, it's ridiculous, you can't do this on a record. Uh, you can do this on stage, maybe, but you can't do it on a record. You know, because they'd see something like Paradise by the Dash for Light, which was like 20 minutes when we did it, with all the acted stuff, you know, Meatloaf making out with Ellen Foley, Phil Rizzuto's speech, which at the time I would do live, you know, going around the bases like in baseball. And they just think, this is crazy, it can't be a record. And I would think, I don't see why not. I, I, don't, I couldn't understand it. To me, it was, it was like the soundtrack of a movie. You just do it like that. Um, Todd was the only one, I swear to God, the only one. Strange enough, the producer we wanted was a guy named Bob Ezrin, who had done Lou Reed, but we couldn't get his phone number. And, um, so, and all the others hated it. Todd listened to us audition at the piano, and he said, OK, I don't see the problem, let's go. He was that casual about it. He always was. That's the great thing about Todd. Nothing surprises him. He's too smart. And um, to this day, I, one of my favorite things about Todd is I don't think he's ever said a complimentary thing to me about the music. But I, I love that. I don't, you know, it's trivial. It'd be petty. Todd's basic attitude is, I think, you know, well, it's a load of inflated junk, but at least it's funny, and I'll do it. Why not? <laughs> and so he did it. And um, his genius in it, I mean, I arranged it with him, but his real genius was I didn't know a thing about record production. So I learned anything I knew from Todd. And um, he knew how to put it together. Uh, he was, I wanted to use Bruce Springsteen's band a lot. I ended up using the drummer Max Weinberg and Roy Bitton, the pianist, who are amazing. I still think best drummer and the best pianist I've ever worked with. They're geniuses, but um, <laughs> here I am using genius again, but they deserve it. Um, Todd fought that because he wanted to use his own band, Utopia, but it ended up being a combination on the album. And uh, he just brought all the pieces together and he did all the background vocals. And let me tell you, watching Todd Rundgren create background vocals has got to be one of the most thrilling experiences you can ever have in music. I can't even describe it. It's, it's, it's as exciting as if you got to watch, I know this sounds hyperbolic, but as if you got to watch Mozart compose or John Lennon compose alone and could be in their head because you can actually see it visually and hear it being created. He makes it up on the spot. And his background vocals, I always wanted tons of background vocals. I'm a huge fan of background vocals. And I didn't know at the time how brilliant he was at it. And he'd have three people, be just three people around a microphone, him and Chasm Sultan from his band, his bass player, and Rory Dodd, who was a singer with us. And he'd hand out the parts, and they were astonishing. You know, he didn't do pads like a lot of background vocals or ahs or oohs. He did complex melodies that intertwined counterpoints. And he'd hand them out and everyone was terrified to admit they couldn't, they didn't have a clue what to do. He would just, and I think he did it partly for perverse fun. He'd go, all right, now this is what you sing. Ah, 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 you. Then you go to the diminished, then you come up here, you do an augmented, then I want you to, he'd go on for like two minutes and say, that's your part, now remember that. Now you do it and they go, what? What? And they never remember it, but it was astonishing to watch him do that. And he helped tighten everything up. He just, he was brilliant. I mean, really, if that, it was fair, that record should be Bad Out of Hell, written by Jim Steinman, starring Meatloaf, uh, produced by Todd Rundgren. Uh, he, um, he, he was a genius. He, he really, partly because he didn't question it. You know, he didn't overthink it like this isn't what happened, this is not what's happening, how do we make this more palatable? He just did it. He accepted the music for what it was, and he did it. I, th I think to this day he probably thinks half the ideas that I made him do in the record are ridiculous and all that, but it didn't matter. I didn't want someone sucking up, I wanted someone great, and he was just awesome. Can't say enough about Todd. Describe the sessions physically, where you were, what the atmosphere was like. Well, the sessions were in Woodstock, New York, in Bearsville Studios, which was Todd's studios. Some of them were there, some of them were at his home studio. They were really, they were really hard for Meatloaf. 
They're really bad for meatloaf possessions. Because Todd, they weren't easy for me either. Um, but I spent a lot of time with Roy Bitten, the pianist, and a lot of time with Todd, working on the arrangements and the music, which Meatloaf really wasn't involved in. And that was really, looking back in a sense, very unfair to me, but it was the only way to get the record done. And Meat, had, keep in mind, he had spent two years with me, you know, rehearsing, working, um, and all of a sudden, he was sort of left out of it. And a lot of that was Todd. Todd's very acerbic and tough. And Meatloaf would a lot of time be in a corner while we were recording, and he didn't know what to say. Um, it was intimidating to me, too. I was just soaking it in, learning from Todd. And I remember once Meatloaf finally, you could see, got up the nerve to leave the corner and come up to Todd. And I remember Todd going, yes, what do you want? Like someone had come in from outside. And Meatloaf said, well, I, I was just thinking, like, you know, this part here, you could do it like Motown, you know, R&B. Yes, we could. That would be wrong, though, if we did. So why don't you go back to the corner and let us make your record? And he didn't take it well. He didn't say anything, but that was one of the nights he tried to kill himself. Um, and it was weird. I don't think he really was going to kill himself, but um, the way I remember it is very detailed because um, we hung around, he left, but he said he'd meet us later to go to a movie. And I remember the movie was The Outlaw Josie Wales with Clint Eastwood. <laughs> That's the details I remember. And uh, we left him detailed instructions on a pad of paper how to meet us at the theater because he wasn't around when we were there at the house. And he didn't show up at the theater. As it turned out, he didn't follow the instructions right. He made some wrong turn, and he thought we were tricking him. He, it was total paranoia. He thought Todd didn't want him involved. I didn't want him involved. He was being treated like, you know, completely unnecessary, you know, irrelevant. And, all, and plus, we tricked him not to come to the movies with us, to Miss Clint Eastwood. Um, but that night, we came home, and uh, the door is opened by um, Rory, who's the singer. And Rory's in complete hysterics and going, oh God, I don't know where you've been. You know, there were no cell phones or anything. He goes, I, I haven't been able to reach you. Me, me try to kill himself. He, I don't know what to do. What are we gonna do? He's trying to kill himself. I said, oh, calm down, calm down, you know. Let's go see what happened. You know, I'm trying to act like I'm in charge. I don't know what the hell I'm gonna do. And um, I was taking this pain medication because of the broken bones in my nose, uh, Darvon, which I really needed because I, I was in pain all the time. And uh, I go upstairs and uh, Rory takes us into the shower and there's me nude in the shower, like curled up in the corner, almost fetal, and with the water dripping down on him. And Rory says he hasn't uttered a word in like three hours. He took an overdose of pills. And I'm going, me, what, what's going on? Uh, uh, uh. And I finally talked to him enough, and he goes, Jimmy, I want to die, I want to die, I want to die. I said, well, that's not a good idea, I mean, you can't die. I mean, if you die, what's going to happen? I'll have to get another singer. I guess I could do that. There's some other, yeah, I could do that. I'd have to change the keys. Rory, could we change the keys? Whoa, what, what, what? This is my acting in my reverse psychology. The first time I was a paramedic, so I was sort of not sure what to do. That was my strategy. And then uh, the only f screw up in the whole thing was um, I said to Rory, what pills did he take? He said, he took your Darvon. I said, you took my Darvon? Me, you animal, you stupid animal, I need that stuff. I was so furious he took my Darvon. But um, we had to get him to the hospital, and it was a riot because Rory really couldn't drive. He was Canadian, didn't have a license, I don't think. But he got in the car, and we're driving terribly to the hospital. I didn't have a license. And meets in the back seat, covered in a blanket, completely out of it. And um, I, I, it worked, my strategy, though. I convinced him. I had this bizarre thing where I got into great detail. I said, you know what Darvon does, me? Now I know you took Darvon. It's not going to kill you. All it does is it, it paralyzes the mucous membranes, which means your vocal cords are going to dry up, which means you won't even be able to talk. You'll have to wear one of those little amplification things in your throat. He says, huh? Uh, uh, I don't want to. I don't want to. No. I said, well, then we'll have to get you to the hospital. He goes, no, no hospital. And he had these amazing flashbacks, like war flashbacks, because when he was a kid, he was hit by a... Um, uh, what do you call it? Not javelin. Um, no, what's the damn huge ball that they throw? Shot put. Yeah, shot put. It's getting my mind. He was hit by a shot put, like, real close range, which is really dangerous. And he had a skull fracture. He had a total psychotic fear of his brain being tampered with and people go, doctors going near his head. And um, so he really, when you mentioned a hospital, he'd freak. And he'd go, no, 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 I'm not going. But when I convinced him that he had to go there and he's going to never talk again, he decided he'd go to the hospital. And we get him to the hospital, and these idiot doctors wouldn't come out to the car. They couldn't get him from the car to the hospital. He said, no, we're not allowed to. You have to bring him here. And we finally got one who was off duty to come help us. And we got him in the hospital, and I had to fill out the forms like the daddy. I filled out all the forms while he was in the other room. 
I remember it was really sad. It was really poignant. And, uh, and then the doctor came to talk to me, like I was the parent. And the doctor said, okay, it's, it's going to be all right. You know, we had to pump his stomach. We got everything out. It wasn't uh, going to be fatal, but it's good that we pumped his stomach. And uh, mainly he's feeling nauseous and sick. That'll last for about a day. And he's feeling, it's psychological is the biggest problem. He's feeling a great deal of shame and embarrassment. And I'm thinking about this, and I'm thinking, well, what do I do? <laughs> you know? um, it was, it was you know, one of the first times I had seen how fragile he also was. He's an amazing mixture of a colossus and a really delicate, fragile flower. I mean, a strange combination. But I guess that's not so strange since a flower can grow up through concrete, can it? Uh, he's, he was both. And um, Todd didn't include him much at all, if any. Uh, Todd was brutally efficient at making the record, you know. Uh, but he was brilliant. He was inspired. The only thing Todd didn't do was mix it. Todd um, mixed the whole record in one day. I didn't know about mixing at that time. Uh, I've come to realize it's the key to making a record in many ways, and it takes a long time sometimes. And uh, the mixes, Todd did the whole album from 4 p.m. to 4 a.m. And it was one of the wildest things I've ever seen. We ended up remixing, it took about two months at least. And, he, and the amazing thing is two of his mixes are on there. Heaven Can Wait and Hot Summer Night. You took the words right out of my mouth. And that was the first song he mixed. You took the words right out of my mouth. He mixed it at his home studio. He had a great little home studio behind his uh, house in Woodstock. And uh, all the EQ stuff was on top. It's usually uh, it's a console. You, this is all on top, so he'd lean up to work it. And I remember he said to me, OK, let's mix the first song. What do you want here? You want Phil Spector? I, yeah, I said that's what you want, Phil Spector, the usual. OK, well, let's try this, this, this. OK, let's see what happens. Then he played the whole song, he didn't touch a thing. The whole song just played from beginning to end, and that's the mix that's on the record. We tried four or five times to see if we could top it, couldn't even come close. And I thought, this guy's a genius, it sounds perfect. Then the next four songs he mixed, I thought it sounded terrible, <laughs> except for Heaven Kuwait. He took a nap at around 1 a.m. for an hour and a half, which is amazing because we only worked that 12 hours. And when he woke up from the nap, he says, okay, let's finish, I'll do a ballad first. And he did the mix of Heaven Kuwait, which is also on the record, it's gorgeous. Um, but when it came to the longer songs, he had a short attention span. And um, he got tired of them, and they weren't good mixes, so we had to go and remix the whole album. And um, that's when I really learned a lot about, you know, producing a record, how much was in the mix. Um, but we simply did what I think Todd would have done had he spent the time. Um, it was just like when he took the record to be mastered. I remember he just handed it, it was like a drive through master place, like Burger King. He, it was a place called Sterling. He handed it in, like drive through He handed it through the window of the, ca the receptionist. And he said, she said, well, what do I do with this? He said, make it sound good. And that was it. And he walked away. And uh, then I had to learn about mastering. And these were the days, of course, of LPs, where this was a nightmare, uh, sonically. That it helped because it was about 28 minutes, 29 minutes per side. And you weren't supposed to have more than nine. Todd think your idea for the uh, motorcycle is a bad idea? Uh, probably, you know, I don't know. You know, it's always, Todd's such a brilliantly deadpan uh, that he doesn't give away a lot. I'm just assuming because he thought probably 90% of my <laughs> ideas were bad ideas. Um, I suspect he did. Um, I know that I was a real crybaby about it. I mean, he did the whole, we had that whole song down and it was brilliant. It was, I remember one take and it was one amazing take and it had this, big hole in it that, you know, I wanted a motorcycle, I wanted to hear motorcycles. And um, I think Todd felt it was all over. And uh, I was like, you know, the really annoying whining kid going, Todd, where's the motorcycle? You said we can have a motorcycle, I want a motorcycle. Like the kid you wanted to slap around. And he says, oh, you want a motorcycle? You don't have enough. A thousand background vocals, a million guitar solos, a 10 minute song, you want a motorcycle? Yeah, I want a motorcycle. He says, all right. I said, do you have motorcycle sound effects? He said, no, I don't deal with sound effects. I'll do it with my guitar. And I said, how can you do that? You can do it with your guitar. I felt like a four-year-old. I always did that with Todd. I always felt like a four-year-old with his daddy because he's so much smarter in music. And, um, and so he said, I'll show you how I'll do it with my guitar. And if you hear the multitracks, you'll hear it's just one take. And I remember he had the most amazing guitar rack. It wasn't even big. It was like, you know, no higher than this piano. And he went over to, he said, let's see, motorcycle, here we go. He said, oh, oh, I remember this great Thai sarcasm. He goes, oh, I forgot to ask you, is it a Yamaha, a Kawasaki, or a Harley Davidson? 
And I said, oh, Harley Davidson. I thought so. <laughs> Why did I even ask? And then he actually, you know, you wonder whether he's a total jazz. He goes and adjusts very specifically, like three buttons on his rack. And you don't know what he's doing. And then he did the motorcycle with his guitar. And it's still one of the most amazing, especially if you know it's one take. He just went there and was like, <laughs> you hear it rev up. You hear the motor, you hear fire coming out of it, you hear it do wheelie, that's my favorite thing. At one point it does a wheelie, you hear it go, and you can just see it rise up and do a wheelie. I mean, it was amazing. I thought he was going to stop for gas. And, then he, you know, it's like with Todd, anything's possible. And, but I, I know that if he didn't think it was a bad idea, he certainly did when he heard me whining, because I was definitely whining. <laughs> I want my motorcycles.